This is the fourth and final component of the lecture on facial fractures. Now let's talk about nasoorbitoethmoidal region fractures. Now you might be saying to yourself, the nasoorbitoethmoidal region, that's really part of the orbit. It's right where the ethmoid air cells and the nasolacrimal sac and the rim of the orbit all come together. That's the nasoorbitoethmoidal region. That's kind of part of the orbit. And I would agree, it really is part of the orbit. But this is such a critical fracture, and it's so subtle when it exists, that I feel it's worth an extra category in my scheme of the critical facial fractures. So I bring it up separately to encourage you to look specifically for this fracture every time you see facial trauma. The importance of the nasoorbitoethmoidal region is that the medial cantha ligament attaches in the nasoorbitoethmoidal region. If the medial cantha ligament is disrupted, it can result in asymmetry of the canthal notch and the medial canthal notch, which has important cosmetic effects. And if it's severe enough, you can even disrupt the anchor point of the globe and end up with diplopia. Fortunately, 90% of the time, a small bone fragment is av avulsed along with an injury to the medial cantha ligament. And it's that bone fragment that we are looking for on a CT. There are other ways of identifying NOE fractures. We can look for asymmetric distance between the medial and lateral side of the uh, globe, between the globe and the orbital rim. There's a very interesting way that the na nasoorbitoethmoidal region fractures were repaired traditionally. The uh, NOE on one side had a cerclage wire placed around it. That cerclage wire was drilled through the nose and attached to the NOE on the contralateral side and then twisted down until the two were the proper distance apart from one another. Nowadays, uh, microplates are small enough that the, that type of repair is not necessary, but it's still an interesting way to repair the uh, fracture. Be aware that there are often injuries to the nasolacrimal apparatus that are associated with NOE fractures, and those should be sought. This is a stereotypical NOE fracture. Here's the fracture fragment that bit has been displaced. This is the nasoorbital ethmoidal region. And this is the avulsed fragment of bone. When you're looking for this, go to the center of the globe and look medially until you see the first bone you come to. That's the NOE. Notice also the difference in the distance between the globe and the medial canthal wall and compare that to the other side. Here's another example showing fragments of bone resulting from an NOE fracture. Again, compare the placement of the globe when compared to the nose on the unaffected and affected sides. Remember that orbital and NOE fractures are often accompanied by orbital hematomas. Those hematomas may be a solid mass-like hematoma, as shown in this example, or they may be infiltrative hematoma that extends through the fascial planes within the intraconal and extraconal spaces. Notice how much exophthalmos results from this hematoma with some tethering of the optic nerve. Okay, let's turn our attention to the maxillary buttress. First, what is the maxillary buttress? Well, it's this complex series of lines that run through your midface that are the force lines running from your occlusal plane all the way up into your forehead. These are all designed to oppose the force of mastication. Unfortunately, when these are fractured, the constant stress of chewing will drive these fractures apart. So they have a hard time healing unless they are transfixed. Now, we like to talk about the maxillary buttress as a theoretical construct, but at a practical level, the maxillary buttress, we're really referring to the walls of the maxillary sinus.
We divide this into an anterior and posterior maxillary buttress, the anterior re referring to the anterior walls of the maxillary sinus, and the posterior referring to the posterior walls. Remember that these are really more complex than just the walls of the maxillary sinus, but from a practical perspective, that's really what we're talking about. This is a rather extreme example of a maxillary buttress fracture in which there is extensive comminution of all the walls of the maxillary sinus. Frequently we see just a tiny fracture line that might extend down towards the alveolar ridge. Even small fractures and non-displaced fractures in this location are worth transfixing because uh, of the difficulty in healing. The hard palate is important for many of the same reasons that the maxillary buttress is important. But there is the additional issue of when you have a hard palate fracture, if you've also disrupted the mucosa, you end up with an oral nasal fistula and people like to have the things they are chewing stay in their oral cavity and not go up into their nose. Once again, we have the problem that the force of mastication will drive hard palate fractures open and prevent them from healing. Also, much like the maxillary buttress, there is pain on chewing, and that is undesirable to patients. One of the challenges when assessing the hard palate is that we're talking about an axially oriented structure being imaged in the axial plane. Thus, the hard palate may appear only on one or two axial images. So it's important to pay attention to those two images and, and particularly evaluate the hard palate. Most of these fractures are oriented in a sagittal plane, and so coronal reformatted images are particularly useful. Here's an example of a sagittally oriented hard palate fracture running right through the midline of the hard palate. You can imagine how, when you're going through hundreds of images, the one image or two images that show this fracture might be easy to overlook. It might also be easy to mistake this for a fusion plane as it runs right down the center of the hard palate. Now that we've covered the seven critical fractures of the face, let's talk briefly about fracture complexes. By far the most common of the fracture complexes is the tripod fracture, also known as the zygomatical maxillary complex fracture. Now the tripod fracture may sound like a bit of a misnomer because we radiologically identify five fracture lines that are associated in a tripod fracture. Those are the orbital floor, the lateral wall of the orbit, the zygomatic arch, the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus, and the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. The reason that it is called a tripod fracture is that those five fracture lines, fracture planes, actually represent three sutures, thus the name tripod fracture. This is an important complex because it is the most common fracture complex that we encounter in the face. And the reason that it is common relies on the malar eminence. The malar eminence is a portion of the zygoma that is palpable in the upper cheek just below the orbit and it forms our high cheekbones. The malar eminence is a particularly inviting target for a fist and for other forms of trauma. Thus, it frequently receives a direct blow and all of its support structures are freed. Those support structures are in fact the five fracture lines that we've already discussed. When you are talking about a tripod fracture, it's important to discuss the displacement and rotation of the fracture fragment. The displacement is almost always posterior in these fractures, and rotation can either be internal rotation or external rotation of the fracture fragment. Here's an example of a tripod fracture as seen in axial plane. You can see the disruption of the anterior and posterior walls of the maxillary sinus. You can see the disruption of the zygomatic arch. This piece of bone right here is in fact the malar eminence. And so that's gonna be our reference point as we assess this fracture. 
The malar eminence is probably only minimally displaced here, probably less than five millimeters. But what's striking is that the fragment is rotated. You can see the decreased interzygomatic distance, and you can see that the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus is blown out. Both of those indicate rotation of the fragment in this direction, in a clockwise direction. Clockwise in the left face is going to be external rotation of the fragment. External rotation may be mild posterior displacement of the malar eminence. Here's an example where the fracture fragment, the malar eminence, is severely displaced posteriorly from its normal location. Compare it to its counterpart on the other side. You can see that there's perhaps a centimeter and a half of posterior displacement. Also, here the zygomatic arch is displaced outward. That is, there is increased interzygomatic distance and the fragment is displaced posteriorly along the anterior border, and you can see the posterior displacement of the fragment relative to the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. All of these indicate internal rotation of the fracture fragment. Here's an example where there's not much rotation, internal or external. The malar eminence still has its normal orientation, with respect to the other bones in the midface, but look how far back it's been displaced. You can see the overriding of the comminuted zygomatic arch fracture as evidence of that posterior displacement. So here's an example without substantial rotation, but with substantial displacement. It would be tempting to extend this lecture and talk all about skull base fractures and talk about the importance of the different foramina across the skull base. Unfortunately, I think that's past the scope of this lecture, which really was supposed to focus on facial fractures. Not that skull base fractures aren't also critically important, uh, but we'll keep this lecture a little more focused. The one piece of advice I have when evaluating skull base fractures is remember that fractures come not as lines but as planes, and you should be able to follow the plane of the fracture from one side of the patient's body to another. There should be a point where the plane starts across the skull base and a point where the plane extends out of the skull base. If you can't find both ends of that, you might, should keep looking for smaller fractures. So, in review, the critical fractures of the face are the frontal sinus, the zygomatic arch, the orbit, and specifically the nasoorbitoethmoidal region, the maxillary buttress, the hard palate, and the mandible. You should seek these fractures on every dictation of mid-face trauma, and you should know what are the critical elements and descriptors of these fractures so that you can provide your surgeons with the information they need to properly plan for their surgeries. This concludes the lecture series on facial fractures.